Thank you, Joyce, for the introduction, and I'm excited to be back again this morning. Day four of ETS, and a lot of y'all have been here since the first day, so just want to give you guys a shout out and say we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, we are about to have a great discussion here. Um, I think we've heard a lot about resilience throughout this event, and um, you know, with all these extreme weather events happening more often, especially in Texas when we had Storm Uri two years ago. I think since that storm, I've heard more about demand response than I ever had before. So we are going to have a great discussion about demand response. Um, I've got Cheryl Melly, the VP Customer Care and Corporate Communications from El Paso Electric, and Eric Rayberg, Chief Engineer and Founder of Armada Power. Um, so could you guys just give a brief introduction to start us off, and Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, it's great to be back here at uh, ETS, year 10. Fabulous work by all of you guys. Um, but my role at El Paso Electric includes energy efficiency, customer care, um, deploying smart grids, even though I, or deploying the smart meters out there, even though I just heard that we don't have to have those, but they certainly will make some things better for our customers. Um, and in a communications team, and you know, we're really working hard on making sure that we are bringing El Paso Electric, um, kind of modernizing the infrastructure, just like the last panel said, but really also really getting our customers to trust and engage with us, because you know, you really have to have that engagement in order for the investments that you make to really have payback for the customers. And so we'll talk about a little bit more as we go. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Eric Rayberg. I'm uh, the chief engineer for Armada Power. Um, we develop a technology for controlling things like electric water heating in real time for the power grid. So our mission is to really make uh, electricity more renewable, reliable, and cost effective. Um, and I think it's you know going beyond kind of the sort of traditional thought of demand response and really turning things into uh, active grid storage assets. Great, thank you. So speaking of resilience, what would you say is the role that demand response plays in resilience? Kind of a broad question, but yeah, I can I can start if you'd like. Um, I, you know, I think of resiliency across kind of two dimensions, right? So there's how do you prevent things from going wrong, and what do you do when things do go wrong? So, you know, to prevent things from going wrong, if you think about it, the fastest way to take down a power grid is to get supply and demand out of balance, right? If you have too much, too much demand or not enough supply or vice versa, that's how you, you crash the power grid. And so today we can sort of support that by, you know, having lots of dispatchable generation. That's how we've done it for the last hundred years where we can make up all these small fluctuations as we turn these bright lights on, right? Some power plant somewhere has to work a little bit harder, you know, when, when those things turn on. Um, or we can, we can manipulate that balance through uh, electric loads as well, but it requires, you know, a lot of, a lot of speed and responsiveness. Um, and the second part is, you know, if we have like rolling blackouts, which have actually occurred a lot more, I think, across the country in the last couple of years, um, you know, anybody that's done like a storm restoration before, it's like very difficult to actually bring something back online because you don't know how much load you're going to get when you close that switch. And so what if all of the electric loads out there could also cooperate with you and say, hey, we're going to hold off. We know you just closed that, that breaker, that recloser in. Uh, let's not, you know, trip something out at, uh, again and start over. Yeah, I think that those are all exactly the right thing, right? Protecting the, the grid and, and I also look to resilience to be kind of something that, again, requires partnership with customers, right? Because I think a lot of times there are, you know, customers just think they should be able to get everything they want all the time and that is always our goal. But there are moments in time because of the extreme weather or because of perhaps a piece of infrastructure that's out that, you know, that resilience piece actually has to be a little bit owned by customers as well. And I think that's the interesting work that you're doing is really trying to, you know, portray that, you know, resilience really is all of us coming together. We're always going to design for worst case. We're always going to operate the grid in the N-1 and make sure that everything is, is ready to go. But resilience is being able to tolerate unexpected things as well. And, and weather the weather, which we're seeing more and more is the cause of some of our major events. And it's also resilience down at a distribution level. And we're seeing, I think, a lot of innovation on the customer side of how does a grocery store become more resilient? What types of um, 
applications do they have that could be demand response when we need it, but it also could be resilience at an endpoint that needs that. And so I think the grid and innovation is really helping us with all of those things as we move forward. We have a good example of resiliency here. We were laughing because our clock died, but the uh, wonderful AV yeah. folks have dragged a, a digital clock up here on the screen, so. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> very responsive. Right? Yeah, very <laughs> It's resiliency. <laughs> so Cheryl, you guys at EPE don't yet have, um, to not all your customers have smart meters. You're sort of in the middle of rolling out an AMI project. Can you talk a little bit about that experience, how it's going so far? Yeah, I'd love to say we're rolling it out. We are preparing to roll it out. <laughs> and we've talked a lot about, you know, big technology projects can, you know, always uh, perhaps maybe you either have the vector or you have the thrust. You don't always have both, right? So I think that was a good analogy of, you know, we kind of know where we want to go, but we um, approached our project by, first of all, having to have a place to put all of that meter data, right? And so a couple of years ago, El Paso Electric decided, well, if we have to have a place to have all that meter data, we might as well change our billing system, and we might as well move that to the cloud. So we uh, are happy to have gone live with our Oracle uh, system in the cloud, and now we're still working through getting the meter uh, processes in terms of being able to do those full exchanges uh, to our customers, and we hope to do that later this month. But we're excited about the meters themselves, because I think that um, we will benefit, I think, first from all of the data that brings and really understanding our customers' loads and usage a little bit more at that detailed level and being able to dig in and segment them. Um, but I think it's also the reality that the average person isn't going to get that excited about it the way we are, right? They're seeing that charge on their bill already of $2 a month, uh, depending on if it's Texas or New Mexico, 20 cents in New Mexico, uh, $2 in Texas. And so right now we're going to have to work hard to get them engaged in that. Um, but we are excited about getting that data and then really being able to deliver to our customers a lot more information. But I think the challenge for us, honestly, is once we leverage the, the good information for us and for our distribution team to operate the grid that's now two-way with lots of EVs and, you know, 140 megawatts of solar out there on rooftops, um, it's going to be us figuring out how do we engage our customers because I don't think it's just natural. I'm the, the geek and I look at my little app and I see what comes in. I'm like, oh man, I've had that electric car for three months. You can't even hardly see the blip. Why didn't I do this sooner? But, but I don't think that I'm the average customer because I've just been in this business for way too long. And so I think that's really a challenge. And I think the last panel, I think with Angie, I think she, she really hit the nail on the head of, you know, you bring all this stuff, but you got to figure out what to do with it. So we're excited to get it. I'm excited to really have an impact on our customers, but we're going to have to really work hard on that. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that philosophy, right? It's not just like putting the gadgets out there, but you're thinking through the infrastructure and the business problems that you're solving and, and putting all, you know, essentially that whole package together. So I think it's, it's very wise. Eric, from your perspective, what are some of the barriers that customers face when, you know, they've, they've got their new smart meters and these programs are available, they maybe want to sign up to enroll, but what are some of the barriers? Yeah, I think a good thought experiment here would be um, how many of you in the audience know what your electric utility account number is? Let's see if anyone's raising their hand. All right, I, I don't see anybody raising their hand because uh, if you if you did, I was going to ask you to recite it. Um, but I think that's a, is a really interesting, right? This is the fourth day of the of the conference. The only people that are left here are all the like hardcore energy nerds, right? You guys are all the biggest energy nerds we could possibly find, and none of you know what your utility account number is. So why do we require people to have that piece of information to like sign up for something like a demand response program? I think that's one of those challenges where you know, and you're thinking like, oh, I signed up for paperless billing. I can download a PDF of my bill. I'll look it up. Yeah, you can absolutely do that, but most most people probably you know, would have a hard time doing that. And so you end up cutting out people that would have otherwise potentially signed up when you, know, you can sign up for electric service without having an account number, obviously, right? So how do you get people to enroll from what they know in their, in their wallet? They know where they live. And I did find out that we have solved that net because, you know, customers don't know their account number. I don't know mine either, but I do know my address. <laughs> and so our customers can actually enroll in our program either with their address or their account number. So, you know, maybe that explains some of the popularity of our demand response and thermostat programs. But, it, but a lot of times on a lot of other programs, even reporting at outages, sometimes we want people to tell us their account number. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm in the dark already, right? <laughs> Right, how would I go find like my last bill in you know, the junk drawer or something like that? 
And how can you know companies like yours or other technology service providers kind of help overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, I think it's it's that partnership and, and really being flexible in the way that you design programs to hit a wide swath of people. So um, one thing that we've seen very successful is actually going after things like multifamily, which have been sort of a traditionally underserved you know, population from, you know, things like utility programs. And so there's an opportunity where you can basically get, you know, one sort of property owner on board with, yeah, I'm, I'm good with all this equipment coming in, but then creating ways to allow things to be, you know, sort of opt-in at like lease signing or, you know, incentives that kind of have to go out to, you know, maybe residents can be like a gift card, but, you know, if you're going to say go to a, a landlord, they, they don't want to get paid with $25 Starbucks gift cards, right? So being, being flexible in the way that you can kind of actually structure those programs and recruit people um, is, has been really successful, at least from, from our perspective. What about actually engaging with the customers? How do you, how does El Paso Electric go about that to kind of educate them around these programs that are available? Yeah, we, we actually, I think that um, we are working hard to get better at that. But, you know, sometimes things just uh, work really well. We, we serve um, New Mexico in addition to um, Texas, our 10,000 square mile um, area. And I'll tell you, the folks in Las Cruces, they are geared up about electrification. And New Mexico is pretty geared up about renewable energy. And so we've had just great success in the past several months where we've been off to, you know, kind of really engage with them on their power up Las Cruces uh, thing. And, you know, part of it's just being out there. I think is what we find is that you know the more people know you and trust you, um, and you have a relationship with them, we're starting to see some of our traditional like you know folks that didn't support our programs, even though we were bringing them good things, storage and solar and you know all kinds of great new energy efficiency things in our portfolio. So I would say that that we're leveraging um, just that get out there and be with people be out at the community fairs, you know, really help them understand, get those electric vehicles out to the farmer's market, promote your thermostats, your refrigerator recycling. And so that's how we're trying to do it. We're also talking a lot about, you know, yeah, we operate the power plants and the emissions come from the power plants, but we only respond to demand. And I think you really have to make it personal and bring people home. I think that somebody was talking about the segmentation and there's people who, I'm all about sustainability, but when it comes down to my personal discomfort or I have to do something, then maybe I'm really just thinking about it, but I'm not engaging in it. And so we're trying to really help our customers understand that every time we turn that last light on when we already said that, you know, we're kind of maxed out here, that if they would just gain some trust with us, we can have, I think, better conversations about, we only need you to do these little things. Sign up for our whole house EV rate because, you know, that means you can charge that vehicle all night after midnight until six or eight in the morning and we'll all be better off. So it really is about establishing the relationship for trust and uh, that's not always easy, but I think that once you get a little momentum there, I think communities really do rally around it and more and more messaging about peak demand, right? Peak is just a little bit of time. We have to build the wires, the power plants. We could do a lot more if we didn't have to build for that little peak. And thoughts, Eric? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, one of the big pieces is, um, in, in our philosophy has been to be as non-invasive as possible, because you're right, I think people want to participate and, and, you know, make a difference, save money on their bill, but at the same time, there, there's a, a tolerance range that I think people have for discomfort and, and adjustment in their lives. So the more that you can do to really be as invisible as possible, um, you know, one of the things that when we roll out programs, uh, a common question that utilities will ask us is like, oh, well, what's your recommendation on like notifying customers that we're, we're doing a demand response event? And honestly, I'd say if you're calling a short event, I wouldn't say anything. Like, you can go a couple hours of something like shutting off an electric water here and no one will notice. Uh, and, we, and we have the telemetry to know that if, if they were going to start to notice, like if your program was getting too aggressive. So, um, you know, it's, one of the, it's, a, it's a, sort of that balancing act of like, yeah, we want to sort of reach out and talk to customers, but there's also sometimes value in not talking to them when you're not going to, you know, make them see ghosts when there, you know, isn't anything to see. Yeah, if they're already enrolled, right? Then Sorry. it's like they don't need to know about every little bit. But that's a great, great point. So you said balancing act and um, one of the sessions I was on the other day they talked about you know resiliency and decarbonization kind of being a, a, a balancing act so 
How does demand response contribute to utilities decarbonization goals? Um, I, I'll, I'll start with that one. I think that, again, it goes back to are people aware of what happens on the grid? And they're not, right? So we just have to talk about that. You know, we do have some, some gas plants that are, you know, 1950s vintage. Those are grandfathered units. They emit carbon, you know, more than the brand new one that we're building. And, and so when people, I think, understand and can put the pieces, one of the other things we've done is really start some customer advisory partnership groups to extend the reach into the community about what that stuff means. And so getting our own customers out to some of these facilities and getting them to, to think about it and look at it, they're like, really, you turn that on? Yeah, we do, when, it, when everybody's, you know, really, you know, peaked out. And so part of that is, I think, get it, trying to continue that, that journey of educating people on what that means, because there is a lot of opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint just by people paying attention. Sun's going down, you may have solar on your roof, and even those customers who seem like they should be educated because they've got solar on the roof, they've got the EV in the driveway, they still don't get it, right? Well, I have solar, so it's okay, right? Well, no, you're actually making us do a lot more of that emission if you don't also look at how you use energy in your home. And so we have that opportunity to really get people more information, and that's why we hope the smart meters help us do that. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to do good campaigns that really educate people on what really happens with solar and what really happens when you know we don't try to at least follow that or add some storage. Uh, but they're connected, right? They're very connected, resilience and, and the carbon and the sustainability goals that we have. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think the irony of this is it's actually not so much of a technological problem anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a communication mm -hmm. and metrics problem. So, you know, I think when you, you, when you look at like the, the regulatory world, right, we've really focused a lot on metrics like energy efficiency or kilowatt hour reductions uh, or potentially in the demand response world like a, a KW reduction. The problem with that is it's only focusing on one measurement point, one number. And it's kind of like back in the early 2000s when digital cameras were getting really popular. And, you know, every year they made more and more megapixels. And so for a period of time that worked. You know, more megapixels was better. But then there was this period where, like, cameras actually got worse because they tried to squeeze too much into that, right, instead of actually looking at, you know, other qualities which are more complicated to explain. And I think carbon efficiency is one of those exact sort of same situations, right? It's not just enough to say, oh, we're shrinking energy use, because every kilowatt hour isn't the same, right? So if you can produce a kilowatt hour from a renewable source, having that dynamic timing to where you can actually absorb it may or may not even be on peak times, right? It could be sort of solar sponging in the middle of the day. Uh, but that's a lot harder to explain to like both regulators and stakeholders and stuff that this is actually like a dynamic level of control, not just one number that we're trying to, we're trying to measure against. So what about equity and access? How does demand response, what, what is the role of demand response in promoting energy equity? I think, um, you know, energy equity is, uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion about that this week and, and how that's rolling out into different communities and what we're doing about that. But, but to me, energy equity, you talked about multifamily and getting thermostats and water heaters in there. Um, you know, that's a lot of where we've got to, I think, do better work, right, landlords, and how we engage in that. Because the easiest way for a lot of people to participate is just by having that thermostat, right? They don't maybe have to have a big expenditure. And we put those thermostats on sale through our marketplace several times a year where you can get them for like $24 or something. Um, but I'd also love to see that become part of the LMI programs where those are just free, right? Because even when you replace your system today, you know, you're like, wait, you're not going to give me, you're just going to give me a controllable thermostat, not, you know, a default to a, a controllable one instead of just one that, you know, I can set all, get all those buttons and time it and everything. I don't really want that product, and I don't think our customers do either if they have the option. But I think just the cheapest way for people to participate in that resiliency um, is to let them have that thermostat while we're also doing the weatherization and other things so that they can feel like they're now high tech and they're able to participate in that future that we all are you know, kind of aspiring to. And it's, it's very affordable and an easy way for people to get involved. Yeah, that's that just the natural fact that it's one of the most cost-effective ways is already uh, makes it easier to deploy. And then the second piece is, I think, you know, giving consumers a little bit of control. You know, I think electricity is one of those um, where you kind of 
show up to the buffet and you put a whole bunch of food on the plate and then they weigh it and then they charge you, you know, you're like, oh, that's, that's like a lot. I'm going to put a few pieces of shrimp back. Like you can't, you know, you can't do that, right? You get, you, get, you pay the bill at the end of the month. Uh, and so a lot of people, like if you have something like a time of use rate or even a dynamic, you know, rate, uh, that's cool, but they don't have the ability to actually change their behavior to, to, to reduce costs. So the more we automate that, the, the easier it becomes to actually be able to deploy that equipment and then also have a, um, a cost impact to, to customers as well. And I think there's also a lot more opportunity there to, um, you know, you get your one time a year, you know, participation, you know, card back from us. But it, I think that there's also a lot of opportunity be because people don't always have a lot of time to just find ways that, that help to give a reward back more frequently than, you know, kind of that incentive piece, right? You know, how do we, how do we move beyond everything having to be uh, just a, that upfront rebate or incentive and really get people to get benefits back when they do things? And I think that would go a long way towards helping not just from an equity perspective, but all customers, really. You know, we all love to win. Who doesn't love to win, right? <laughs> Yeah, then you're more top of mind too, because it's not just like a one-time thing or a once a year, once a year thing. But yeah, yeah. Um, we do have a, a few minutes left. I've got a couple of questions left, but I wanted to see if there were any question, any audience questions, out in that sea of lights. Uh, Jason's got a question up front. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Eric and Aaron. Uh, Cheryl, questions for you as in this last storm, where were some of those? Did y'all even, did El Paso Electric feel some of that? And, and if so, what are some of the lessons learned from that storm, the most recent one? Which one was the last one? Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> good you question. You mean the big Yuri, or do you mean the, uh, the one that you had here in Austin? The one in Austin. The one in Austin. Yeah, no, we were fortunate. We did not um, get hit by that event that came through the central. Texas area. You know, there's some nice things about living in the desert. <laughs> you know, we don't have too many of those big trees until you get up into our beautiful mountains in New Mexico. Um, but yeah, we were, we were spared from that one. And also Storm Uri, where, right, where we felt like, you know, diversity really came in handy, fuel diversity during that one to have nuclear, natural gas, renewables, and, you know, tanks from full of oil sitting next to our gas turbines. One question right here. Hi, how are you? Um, I was wondering, do you foresee a future where all of this technology is getting to a point where the utility doesn't need permission at all to, for residents to participate? Because already, if, the, if you don't have enough power or if, you, if there's some problem, the residents aren't getting power. So at what, what is that fine line where Utilities can just say this is a um, terms of service where we re reach a certain metric, possibly push a state regulator to agree, and that's just it. And then they just get a coupon at the end of the at the end of the year, or you know, um, you know, for their participation, uh, for um, participating in the wholesale markets. Do you foresee that? I think it's a fascinating philosophical question for sure because it's you're right like if, if at a certain point if you don't cooperate you know we just shut power off because we can't support it so there's it would it would benefit everybody if there was a uh, a, a dial somewhere in the middle um, th there could be a potential for that I think the key if if we were going to look at ways to do that would be really to focus on that like kind of non-invasiveness as much as possible because at the end of the day you know the homeowner or consumer can just wire around whatever countermeasure that you put in there if you're trying to force some sort of behavior so it still has to be that kind of cooperation but I think it's a super interesting idea of like where do you actually blur that line of control and um, you know who has the ultimate authority authority to, to, to control things like electric loads. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we see a little bit of that with the grid mod discussion and infrastructure, right? The first place that utilities can do that is with volt bar optimization where a customer never really even knows that we're doing something to manage the grid besides just keep, you know, generating more to meet their load. But I, but I do think that is an interesting question. And he mentioned the water heaters, right? We don't have a lot of electric water heaters, but as Las Cruces and New Mexico really get you know, deep on the electrification issue, they're already starting to develop some all electric neighborhoods. And so those are places where we would like to be cooperating and looking at that. Um, and I think electric vehicles, for sure, are gonna be one of those places where if you're a residential electric vehicle charger, 
and you've got a, a you know enabled device there for managed charging. Yeah, why would why would you have to opt into that sometimes, right? If you're on during certain hours. But I think it's a great philosophical question uh, that if we're not cutting it off, do we have to really declare an emergency, or should the utility just be able to operate the distribution as you know to optimize it? Yeah, and Volvar Control is an awesome example of that. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. All right, I'll ask one last question. Um, so seeing as it's our 10th anniversary of ETS, and Cheryl, I think you've been at almost all of them. There's maybe been a couple that you've missed, but um, so in the spirit of 10, looking back a decade, so much has changed over the past 10 years. What do you guys think is in store for the next 10 years? Sure, yeah, I can, I can go first. Um, you know, I, it's, it's always tough to say, right, because we, we're seeing so much kind of like new technology and, you know, everyone was like, you know, everything's going to be blockchain a couple of years ago. Now it's going to be, you know, AI and all this stuff. And, um, and there absolutely could be huge impacts to our economy. But I also think there's something to be said for let's also not forget cool, like low tech stuff, right? Like demand response in, in the grand scheme of things is actually like relatively low tech, but it's really effective, a really effective solution. Um, and I think like, you know, the over dependence on, on AIs and data analytics is going to be um, kind of fraught with some, some issues in it. And if we look at a future where, you know, things like computer aided reasoning is just super duper abundant, um, the irony of all that is the, the scarce resource is actually going to be, you know, human intuition and, and decision making. So can't, can't lose sight of that despite all of the kind of cool new technology that might come out. There is, but I think I, I think if you look forward ten years, I think that we're so much further along on our, our journey to, um, you know, the the cleaner grid that we're aspiring to. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to have that modular nuclear until at least ten years from now. I think is what we heard in the first panel of the day, which I think that's really exciting technology, and you know, the thought that that will be uh, a part of that clean energy future, I think is is something that we probably have all been thinking about, but maybe not trusting, but I think that, you know, we finally are getting to a place where that might be the reality, and I think that, that will go a long way. I, I think that we will have more electrification, so I think um, the grid is going to need continued investment, and that is actually going to be one of those places that really does demand that we really focus in on customer education. And hopefully customers are much more um, self-serving and you know, digital so that they're really helping us drive the cost out of business. I know I closed my walk-in centers um, last year in Texas, this year in New Mexico. And, you know, it's amazing how even though you, a regulator or, you know, a legislator or somebody might think that's going to be a big deal, customers adopt. Uh, and so I think that customers will continue ad to adopt and want to participate. But you're right, it has to be easy. And, you know, some of it has to be behind the scenes but really giving them more information more frequently about what they're really doing and being able to give them predictions and information that helps them make easy choices when they're sitting on the couch at night watching Netflix. Oh, look, El Paso Electric's telling me if I was on this rate, I would have saved $5 this month. You know, they shouldn't have to go to my website or call me and do that. So I'd like to think that we really can lead the way in making sure that we're partnering to those types of realities. Uh, I'm just giving you the information and, you know, take it. It's $5 a month. Why not? All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>